Hanushu's lab in Black Belt. Uh, I've been working on this project uh, for the past couple of years, which involves sequencing and assembling the genome of the Rathanis tumor wild radish, and then doing some analysis to basically find out the evolution of duplicate genes in, 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 uh, in recipe changing compared to genomics. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who have worked on this project. Uh, Shanghal is my mentor, and David Hafnagel is an undergrad in the lab. He was work uh, for almost the same time as me. Uh, this project is actually a, a collaborative project between Dr. Jeff Connor, Ian, and Shinhan, and it's an NSF funded project. Uh, Alicia Massa from Robin Beer's lab and John Johnson at HPCC have also uh, worked, uh, helped me at various stages in the, in the project. We also have collaborators at Craig Mental Institute, uh, Dr. Krishna and Hyper Bank, and also thanks to the MSU dissertation. So my talk is divided into three major parts. I'll first be talking, giving you a brief introduction about why we are sequencing, why we are sequencing radish, uh, and particularly what is of interest to us uh, in terms of the projects going on in Shinhan's, Shinhan's lab, which is addition of polyparity and duplicate genes. Then I talk about how we sequence the genome in very brief, and then talk about gene prediction and uh, how we define orthologous groups. And finally, how we use this information to uh, look at the divergence time of different species in the lineage and look at the evolution of the PK genes and patterns of pseudogenization. So, uh, wild radish is actually, we know of cultivated radish, it's, it's consumed in, in large parts of the world. But wild radish is considered an agricultural pest in the United States. It, it has a strong root system, it, it's used as a model for uh, herbivory too because of its secondary metabolites and it's, it's spread all over in large parts of, of uh, North America. Uh, in, at MSU, Dr. Connor has been studying this for a long time, uh, especially he's been studying the correlation between different parts of the flower. Because the radish, uh, the, 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 one of the features that is of importance in ecology and fitness of the, of the species is the difference between the height of the corolla tube and the anthers. Here, uh, if the anthers are too small, then the pollinators are not able to uh, take out the pollen as easily, and that basically affects how uh, affects the range of various populations. Uh, and so, it's been developed as an co vivo model system uh, here at MSU. Now, in for in our lab, uh, we have been looking at evolution of duplicate genes in plants and. Uh, one major reason for that is polyploidy is, is highly prevalent in the plant world. So what I'm showing here is all of the sequenced genomes. Uh, and in just the sequenced genomes, you have several instances of polyploidy which have actually been found out. Some are very recent, right, in the, in the uh, very close to the um, species, where others are quite far off in the evolutionary history. Now, once the whole genome, once the genome duplicates, you at that point of time you have two duplicate genes. Now, over time, these two genes evolve. There are mutations that accumulate in the genes, and you can have one of these four fates. So, either uh, there can be gene retention. If the gene is retained, you can have uh, the ancestral functions being partitioned into the two copies. That's called subfunctionalization. You can have new functionalization where one of the genes gets uh, completely new functions. You can have pseudogenization uh, wherein there are stop mutations or frame shift mutations and the gene loses its functions completely. Or you can have the entire region getting deleted and you, are not a, you won't be able to detect such, such uh, cases at all. In, in, our, in, the, in the Brassicaceae family, there are two instances of whole genome duplication known. One was the whole genome duplication event that occurred several, uh, about 65 to 70 million years ago. Uh, and another was a whole genome triplication event which occurred about uh, 20, 30 million years ago in the evolutionary history of just Lassica and Radish. So we had two whole genome triplication events uh, which we intend to study, intended to study in this in this project. And the Lassicaceae family actually consists of several commercially important crops. So you have turnips and broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower all part of the Lassica and the Radish lineage. So, uh, first I talk about how we sequence the genome in the So, basically, we 
we sequenced the fifth generation in bread plant of Raphael's Raphael and that was done using both Illumina and 4 by 4 sequencing. But, so Illumina is, uh, Illumina reads are very short, we just had 100 days per read length. The read length of this was variable but they were quite long reads and, but we can only sequence a small amount so we just had 3x coverage of, of 4 by 4 sequencing but 47x coverage of Illumina. And using bunch of different uh, sequence assembly programs, uh, I can go into details if someone wants to look, but finally we assembled, um, uh, as Ian likes to call it, a draft genome of the Raphinus Raphinistra, uh, of Raphinus Raphinistra. So the actual genome size is estimated uh, by, by uh, four cytometries about 600 MB, and we were only able to sequence about 154 MB of the genome. Now that, uh, itself is quite fragmented. The N50 of the genome is just 10.1 kb, uh, which is very small. As compared to that, the Brassica genome, which was released just a couple of years back, had a significantly higher uh, N50, 27.3 kb. And, but, so they had 72x coverage of the genome and they, they put a lot of money into it because it was quite, uh, the sequencing was quite extensive. But still, they could only get 174 MB of the genome sequence. So that that's probably because about 30 to 40 percent of the brass, of of the brassica and radish genomes are considered to be heterochromatinized and repetitive. So we weren't able to sequence the rest of the genome. Um, the good thing about the brassica assembly is that they also have scaffolds, and that increases this length considerably when you look at scaffolds. So even though we have this 254 MB sequence, we could map about 80% of the ESTs from radish back onto the assembly. Uh, and if you look at some highly conserved genes, which are conserved from uh, uh, highly conserved eukaryotic genes, which are conserved from yeast to humans, there are some 250 genes like that in this data set. About 97% of them were present in our assembly with a high degree of coverage. So that means we were able to sample the genic space uh, quite extensively. Uh, despite the low coverage of sequencing that we had. Now, to predict the gene models, we use this pipeline called Maker, uh, and what it does is you take in EST sequences, protein sequences, uh, RNA seq transcripts, uh, and we know predictions from computational programs, and basically predict which regions in the genome would play genes. And then we use a bunch of filtering based on this measure called AED or annotation edit distance. Uh, to find out which of the 74,000 gene models predicted are really uh, of good quality. And based on several filtering steps, we finally arrived to 38,000 gene models in radish. And this number is comparable to what we find in, in Brassica, which has about 41,000 genes. Now, using all the gene models in Brassica, radish, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, and Arabidopsis lyrata, we generated orthologous groups using Raxamel and multiple sequencer and Raxamel. So the next thing we did was uh, we wanted to know when Brassica separated from Radish. Uh, and for that we used two different methods. One is a simple formula which is synonymous substitution rate or KS upon 2 into Newton substitution rate per site per million years. And the second was using Gaussian dating. What we want to find is uh, there are two genes, maybe they are whole genome duplication, they are paradox, or they could be orthodox in two different species. What is the T for, for different events? So using these two methods, we were able to assign these values to the, to the different uh, events in the lineage. The first number uh, is the median of the KS distribution, or the values calculated using KS, and the second number is the value calculated using the Bayesian approach, and both of these values seem to uh, agree uh, with each other. So what, what happened was uh, papaya was, a, was an outgroup, and using that what we find is uh, about 35 million years ago the two lineages diverged. The version duplication event occurred around 25 million years ago, and radish and drastic separated around 13 to 19 million years ago. Now, uh, since, so the in, in both of these species, you have around 30,000 genes. And if there was a whole genome replication event, you expect to see uh, 90,000 genes present in Brassica and Radish, but you only see about 40,000 genes. Uh, when we look at orthologous groups, 
we find that, so you basically you expect to see for every gene in Haria line, you expect to see three genes in Rasika and Radish. But most of the orthologous groups contain just one gene. Now in this figure, each row is an orthologous group. Uh, the blue color indicates one member of that species in that orthologous group. Uh, a, a pale color indicates zero members. So these are either lineage specific in Brassica and Radish or lineage specific in Haryana and Dairata. And the red color indicates two copies and bright red indicates three copies of the, uh, three members in that orthologous group. So most of the orthologous groups contain just one member. Uh, in each species, while there are only a few which have two or three members. Uh, based on this, we define two sets of uh, uh, original duplicates. One are one we call retained duplicates, which in old literature have also been called orthologs, and singletons, which in which there is only one copy remaining and the rest of the two copies cannot be found or have been so registered. So the first question was, uh, what are the functional differences? Are do, do these kind of genes be tend to have certain functions that are enriched. So we looked at gene ontology categories uh, between the two groups and uh, in this figure the size of the square indicates the significance of enrichment in using Fisher exact test. So this means that this is more significantly enriched in retained duplicates as compared to single test. Uh, transcription factors seem to be significantly retained other sets of categories here are response to stress. Several different stress response genes tend to be retained. You have several signaling pathways which are also responsible for stress response that those are also retained. And several categories related to development. Uh, when you look at singletons, actually, uh, the singleton genes tend to be enriched in uh, functions like DNA repair and RNA processing and some central metabolic pathways. Now, we wanted to look at this in more detail. Uh, not just look at only GeoSlim, which is a bit incomplete. We wanted to look at several different features. So, uh, I'm actually quite proud of this figure. It's, it's a very long figure <laughs> and it has a lot of information in it, but I have to split it uh, and I don't have time to explain this entire thing. So, I'll just exp explain just a few snippets from here. Uh, we looked at GeoSlim categories, which is actually a lower resolution of the gene ontology categories and more broader. Look at some sequence related characteristics like protein size, uh, gene size, and GC content, and so on. Uh, we looked at expression related categories, breadth of expression, uh, whether the expression level of certain genes is very high, uh, whether they tend to be responsive to biotic and abiotic stress, whether they tend to have a uh, higher number of interactions, like higher number of network partners, uh, and they tend to be conserved across species. Now, for each each feature, uh, the question we asked was, are uh, uh, do retained duplicates tend to have a higher proportion of each of those each of those bins as compared to singletons? Now, what we what you find after analyzing this for so for each each comparison, we did a Fisher exact test and the numbers here represent again the Q value of the Fisher exact test. So what we find here is uh, retained duplicates genes that tend to be retained post fusion duplication tend to have higher expression levels, they tend to be expressed broadly across various different conditions or tissues and they tend to be more responsive to biotic and abiotic stress. They also tend to have higher network connectivity, they interact with many, many I think 15 plus partners with the brain that is enriched here and they tend to evolve slowly between species or, and uh, singletons tend to be linear specific, they are present in the two or three species but uh, retained duplicates tend to be present all across uh, the 15 species that we analyzed using BLAST. So, okay, we have all of these features that we know are enriched. Uh, now, if for a gene, so for retained duplicate and for, if you are given a gene uh, and it has a set of features, are you able to predict whether it will be a retained duplicate or a singleton? Will you be able to classify these two populations from each other? For that, we use a, a method called support vector machines, which is uh, a machine learning method. And the idea behind that is you have these two sets of genes and you have all of these features for each each set. Um, now, using this, uh, how efficiently are we able to separate, classify these two populations from each other? So, um, yeah, we have about 65 features like this from the table that I showed previously. 
and the advantage of SVN is that it does cross validation while it is uh, learning the parameters involved in separation. So it reduces the chance of overfitting and it's more efficient than um, perhaps other methods like uh, logistic regression and PCA, which is actually a classification as well. So we looked at two different, uh, these are two different figures, one is precision recall and another is true positive, false positive. In both of these figures, the dotted line indicates the random expectation from an entire pool of genes. If you randomly pick out genes and ask, is this a recent duplicate, is this a singleton, then you would get this kind of a performance, uh, which is represented by the dotted line. The, the blue lines indicate the alpha duplication event, which occurs occurred way back, and the red line indicates the more recent alpha prime duplication event. Now, in this case, uh, we are definitely performing better than random guessing. So, uh, our model is significantly better than these. But what you what you want is a very high precision and a very high recall. The point here, we are not reaching that yet. In this curve, uh, what you want is a, a curve shape like this. Higher the area under the curve, the better. So, but we are only able to predict a little bit. Uh, uh, and even at even at a true positive rate of 0.7, which is the highest uh, AUC, you you still have a false positive, significant false positive rate. So either this means that there are some features that we are still not able to find out, we are not able to uh, put in our model, or there are some um, there is some bit of randomness that is involved in when these genes are getting deleted uh, from the genome post for gene duplication. So finally, uh, we looked at the genes that are not present in our annotated gene data set, which are pseudogenes. And Shinhan had published a paper in 2009, which uh, takes in all the annotated proteins from the species and we perform a blast against all the, the entire genome and find out some protein fragments, which are, uh, which are small and which perhaps have stop code on the frame shift mutations in them and you classify them as putative pseudogenes. If you do that for all four species, the y-axis here shows the number of pseudogenes in the species. Halian and Lairata, the number is, is, is quite small, but in Brassica and Radish, you see a huge number of pseudogenes. Now some of these could be derived with virgin duplication. The red indicates if you just run the pipeline on the assembly, how many pseudogenes can you find? But the brassica and the radish assemblies are fragmented, they are small. So there's a chance that if there's a real protein which can get split between two contexts and you might misidentify one as uh, uh, a wrong, uh, as a pseudogene. So the green bar indicates if you correct for the fragmentation, how many you get. And so you see quite a few of the, quite a few pseudogenes present in each of the species. Now some of these could be derived from random replication, some of these could be derived from whole gene replication. Uh, okay, actually the first thing that we are, I wanted to show was, these are real pseudogenes. When you look at K A K S R, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, evolutionary rate between different paralogs and orthologs, uh, the, the comparison between the, the, the functional gene and the pseudogene that is predicted using that sequence, uh, if you do a K A K S for that, these sequences are significant, are working at a significantly higher rate than other sequences, so these are definitely pseudogenes. Uh, now to define the pseudogenes that are derived from whole genome duplication, I used uh, KS, uh, the synonymous substitution rate. KS should not change because it's assumed to be it's assumed to be neutral. It's occurring at synonymous sites which are not in the selection. So ideally speaking, it should not uh, it should not be affected by the process of pseudogenization. So in this figure, you have uh, the red line indicates the brassica radish. Uh, the times of the brassica radish diversions obtained from the KS values. The green line indicates uh, the time obtained, the KS distribution of um, the paradox between between radish radish uh, or brassica brassica. And the the blue line is actually Thaliana brassica speciation when which are uh, radish species which are a long time back. And I put a threshold at 25th and 75th percentile of the, of the green distribution and ask how many, uh, 
and basically all of these pseudo genes we call them as derived from cohesion multiplication. Now, the, the question here was we know T based on this, we know that T is about 25 million years, which is the time when the cohesion multiplication event occurred. Now, after the event occurred, this gene might have kept on evolving at a particular rate for some time and then suddenly there was a mutation at some point and then it started evolving at a neutral rate. So we want to find out what this T1 is um, and we know the rates of evolution at each of these. Uh, we can assume that using uh, the KAKS between the gene and the autologous group. So using this formula where all of these uh, rates as well as times are known except T1, we can calculate for each pseudo gene what is the, when did this event occur, when did this originalization event occur. So, um, when I, so this line represents the timing of pseudogenization for about 4,000 pseudogenes, uh, 3,000 pseudogenes uh, in, in radish. And what, what I find is the, the rate, number of pseudo, the number of pseudogenes formed in uh, about 40, 30 million years ago is small, but it, then it goes, uh, after the duplication event, it's, it's fairly, fairly constant. But there is, there is actually a, a problem with the way this, this plot is constructed because the duplication event occurred at one time, it occurred at 25 million years ago. So this distribution should have, should have been a point, but the fact that it's a distribution, uh, it, it creates, we need to normalize the time somehow. So basically what, what we did was, uh, I, I normalized the number of pseudo genes that are produced at each time to the number of duplicate genes that are already formed before that time, because only those genes can pseudogenize. When you do that, you find a fairly constant rate of decay, uh, about 11 to 14 percent. So every year, uh, every family years, uh, since coincidental multiplication, there has been a consistent loss. Uh, the alternate possibility would have been after the original multiplication, there was a peak of pseudogenization, or the rate might have increased uh, immediately after pseudogenization and then and then gone down. But what we see, in fact, is a more or less constant rate of pseudogenization that occurred since the original multiplication event, which was here. But to summarize my talk, uh, we have sequenced about 254 MB of the radish genome and collected about 38,000 genes. Um, <coughs> our results suggest that there are certain attributes of genes like high expression level and the breadth of expression, how important those genes are to, to networks. Those might um, play an important role in whether they are retained post origin multiplication. And you can, uh, after the origin multiplication event, the, the nuclear genes that were created were probably lost at a fairly constant rate over time. Uh, your last point about the pseudogenization, um, why do you speculate on why even after the duplication events it's still the same rate? After the duplication event? Yeah. So, what is um, so these, all of these are actually derived from homogen duplication, but the fact that it's a distribution, it, it, it confirms things. But in this case, even though the rate is, is constant over time, it probably means that um, there are certain networks that are present within the cell, within the cell, and you can't probably delete uh, all of the copies instantly. That that. Uh, Perhaps we don't we don't know what physiological consequences it has, but it might have uh, consequences in uh, in network evolution. Yeah. A maybe related question is, I at least intuitively as a gut reaction, I guess I'm surprised that the genes that were differentially retained, or the categories that were retained more often, if I understood it correctly, were things that were conserved and highly expressed, mm -hmm. and somehow that seems a bit surprising. Um, so do you have a an explanation for those broad so, categories? Um, one of the reasons we thought we have seen high um, uh, 
So retained duplicates having high expression level. First of all, we were analyzing bilinear data sets because they were huge data sets. And so one, our initial hypothesis was there is cross hybridization in tiling arrays. You have retained uh, transcripts coming from duplicates that are present in the copy, so you can have high expression levels because of that. So we also analyzed RNA seq data, uh, where the reads were mapped to a single location in the genome. And even there, we saw a high uh, enrichment in this category. So it's definitely not technical. Uh, in terms of biological interpretation, what I think is these, uh, these, the uh, the functions that are the we, we don't know whether highly expressed genes tend to be retained or uh, retained genes tend to have high expression. It's just difficult to point out exactly uh, what the cause effect thing is, but it is possible that these genes are highly expressed and uh, because of the expression level they play an important role in the cell somehow and that's why they are retained. Because those genes also tend to have a high number of interactions uh, with, with several different partners in, 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 in networks. So that's why I think that it's probably because of importance that they are retained. So if it's driven by networks, does that suggest or support Subfunctionalization going on, that they're sort of in different tissues uh, manipulating those networks, or I don't know, maybe it's too high level of statistical pattern to really figure out. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult to figure out using the data that I have. So, all of this data is actually obtained from Parabidopsis, the breadth of expression. Yeah. After the original duplication event, we don't know how uh, this is happening. So you didn't use the RNA seq levels from the flowers, the radish flowers? No, no, that was not used here. Okay. Not used here. Maybe one thing you see that are just correlated with the right process. Mm -hmm. The seq may all remain high expression. Mm -hmm. so this, <coughs> excuse me. This might be a, a stupid question. I might have missed something, but the, the final graph that you showed, mm -hmm. the most salient feature to me, was wasn't the, the constancy across most of the graph. It was this enormous uptick on the right hand side. Yeah. Um, and that sort of, that. The sample size yeah, is very low. Well that you hypothesize about. <laughs> in this bin, the sample size is very low. It's just 80 genes as compared to oh. 300 and 400 <laughs> genes each. It's still a big difference. If it's even as big as 80, then they have 90% of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think it's it's either because of that or because I have built everything that is greater uh -huh. than 40 in uh, the same so it's time time span. Span. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed the yeah. <laughs> Is that last bin the same size? No, no, it's, no it's 40 plus. Okay. Would you know how big the bin is though? Uh, I don't know the maximum size. The maximum time that I have predicted. Yeah. But I, the size of the bin, there are eight, 80 members in the bin as compared to here at current numbers that that's what I can tell. So you mentioned some of the functions of genes that are uh, duplicated and retained in wild radish, but what about uh, the functions of genes that were once functioning and are now uh, pseudogenous? What are some of the functions where you don't retain multiple copies? We, we, I don't remember if we, I, we haven't looked at that. Yeah, we'll do that.